Hi everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our Life of a Color series. Today, we will be talking about formulation. Taking over the series from Thomas is now Tim Mao, our Applications Engineering and Technical Support Manager at X-Ray. I'm Robert Grotan, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a few things to go over before I turn it over to Tim. If at any time you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit them in the space provided and we will follow up with you after the webinar. This webinar will also be recorded and you receive a link tomorrow so that you can review this webinar again at your convenience. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to get things started. Thank you, Robert. So as he said, as Robert mentioned, um, this is webinar number three in our series um, of the life of a color. And today we're gonna talk about formulation. So this is a quick reminder of where we've been. You've seen this before in the first two webinars in this series. Um, so we're really in this third step, which we might call pre-production or formulation. Um, it's really the step that has um, maybe where some of, the, some of the most conflict comes in because we're having to move the color from an idea and a specification um, often done with totally digital color, we're now having to move it to the real world or to the physical world. We're gonna have to physically make this color. Um, so let's talk about how we do that. Um, one more reminder, this is what we're working on, right? We had the life of a color. Um, the, we were doing a, doing a seasonally inspired version of this toy using this color palette. Um, that's the same thing that Thomas shared with you. What I will be talking about today is specifically color matching one of those colors. And we're gonna work on the one called Epiphany. You see it highlighted there. So matching the color is really four things we've got to think about. The standard, what what is it we're matching, right? Is it digital, is it physical? How do we deal with that? What are the required properties of the match, right? It's not only um, its color, but it may need to meet other requirements. If it's, a, if it's a plastic toy for a child, obviously we have to be concerned about the fact the child might put it in their mouth. So that might tell us something about how we're gonna do it. Then we're gonna talk about how we formulate and correct our formulas, adjust them, and then how do we achieve a customer agreement and sign off? Because that would mean we're ready to go to production. So the standard. So it might be digital. It might be sent to us as an, a CXF file, which is a, a digital way to exchange color data. It might be sent to us um, a, as a Pantone color. So we might use Pantone Live. Um, those are two ways to digitally import the data. Might be something that we're gonna measure. And we might use something like this, like a benchtop device um, or a handheld device where we're gonna take a physical measurement of the product that we've been provided. Now, whether it's digital or it's measured, the path forward to do the matching and everything remains the same, but we have to be concerned about that. And whether it's digital or measured, we have to be concerned about this information we're kind of showing you here about how was that measurement done? Um, if it was done with a sphere instrument, was it done specular included or specular excluded? And was it UV filtered or not? whether it's digital data where we can see that information from the digital data or how we had our instrument physically set up, those things will impact that color and give us a different color that we're matching. That's why we've got to get it right. So we're going to go ahead and say we've got our colors. In fact, here are, the, are all of the colors that were in that palette. You can see um, an LABCH representation of each of the colors. Um, you can see the, a visual representation of each color and you can see their reflectance curves. Um, and as you see in the upper right hand corner, when we're talking about formulation, we're going to be using this piece of software called iMatch. And iMatch is a, is a piece of software that helps us figure out how to do color match and calculate matches. So when we get into matching the color, we think about um, required properties. For example, if it's plastic, I gotta think about what resin I'm using. If I'm doing it, if it were paint, I'd have to think about, is this going to be a latex, an acrylic, an alkyd, um, a solvent-based paint? If it were um, fabric, I might think about what kind of dyes I'm using and what kind of fabric I'm using. We've gotta decide about those. What, what, what properties are required? Those are likely specified to us, but they will contribute to our final formula. 
we have to think about which colorants, which mixture of things, which ingre coloring ingredients, let's put it that way, can I make available to be used to calculate the formula or the recipe for this color? Again, that might be controlled by the properties of those colors. Um, do I need to meet some kind of compliance, FDA kind of a compliance or um, some other kind of compliance that may be required? Am I even doing um, eco-friendly product? Uh, I want to be able to advertise and, and identify that what we're doing is an eco-friendly. Maybe I've got an eco-friendly um, label on, then I've got to deal with things like, oh, do I have to consider some post-consumer content, recycling of things that are coming into this? So once I've considered all of those, and I'm going to come back here and say, okay, let's go figure out and match this color epiphany. So I'm going to load it into the software, and then in the software, actually, I'm going to load all those colors into the software, as you see, and then I'm going to pick all of those things we talked about, a resin and a set of colorants. And now we're gonna look at, well, can I make these colors with what I've selected? And we're doing that by looking at what software generates is called a gamut. So that kind of strangely shaped mass of color that you see represents all of the colors that could be produced by the set of colorants and the resin that I selected. And you can see that four of those colors have are, are green dots because they're inside the gamut, meaning I can make those colors, those I could match those standards with my set of colorants because I can make anything inside of that blob, right? To the left, you'll see there are two red dots because those are colors or color standards that actually fall outside of what's possible with this particular set of colorants. So maybe I'm trying to make something that's not achievable. That's where the conflict may come in. Now, perhaps, and in this case, this happens to be true, I selected a small set of colorants to show you what happens when something falls outside the gamut. But if that truly were the only colorants I could use, it would be time to go back to the design people and say, I can't make that color. This is, I'm not going to be able to match it exactly. And maybe they say, okay, we'll match as close as you can. Maybe they say can, we need to bring in new colorants, or maybe they say we're going to redesign with a different color. Now, in my case, I have the option to add more colorants, and so let's see what happens when I do that. So I add more colorants, my blob has changed shape, size, and shape. And now I can match all of those colors in that palette by maybe these are higher cost colorants that give me a larger palette. So it may be some negotiation about cost coming into play but it's given me the ability to go match this color or these colors and meet all of the criteria. So knowing that I can do that, I'm now gonna go ahead and formulate my epiphany color. And when I do that, the color iMatch software generates for me a number of formulas. And I have them, you'll see the, there's a formula number listed on the left-hand side, formula number 10 at the top, and then, various other formulas and their numbers are just um they're they're just numerically generated as as it calculates them the, the number itself just means what order it was calculated the order they're sorted in right now is based on some scoring mechanisms that are going on which are considering things like color difference under three different illuminants metamerism um even cost is is cal can be calculated so we can look at all of these different formulas and I might decide you know what I really like this formula formula four I can see the reflectance curve over here of whichever one I've selected I can see visually how the color will look under different light sources or illuminants so I may pick my formula formula four there it is and I can go ahead then and scale that to whatever batch size I want to make typically in this process of course we're we're doing a new color match so we're going to make a small um a relatively small anyway lab sample to prepare let's say i'm going to prepare that i'm going to mix that up i'm going to do whatever i have to do to produce a sample that i can measure and once i've done that i take a measurement of it and there's my batch and my batch came in 
1.63 units too light and 1.23 units too red, 0.392 yellow. So it's off by 1.01 delta E CMC. So that, that formula did a pretty good job, but it's not close enough for me. So I wanna know and calculate, can I do any better? Well, formulation software like iMatch has the ability to do what's called a correction. And the correction step simply says, okay, here's how far off you were, 1.63, 1.23 and so on. We're gonna make a correction or an adjustment to your formula to get you down to 0.14. And so I now have two formulas. I have my entered percent, that's how much was in my batch. I have my new percent saying, this is what the formula should be changed to. Okay? And if I come over here and let's say I had made up 1500 grams or kilograms, or it doesn't really matter what the units are. I made 1500 of something here. I could, could go add these amounts to that. And by adding those, I would get it to equal what this new formula was. So I would make that adjustment. And we can even see it graphically here on the right. The red dot is where we were. It failed. It was outside. And the green dot is where this correction is going to take us, um, with the crosshairs, of course, being the standard. So sometimes I can get into a bit of an iterative process where I'm going to correct it. Maybe I measure that, and it's not 0.14. It's point Two eight, let's say. Is 0.28 close enough? Depends on what my tolerance is, depends on what the end use is. If it's good enough, when I get to that color that's good enough, the match is good and I want to use that. Now what's often happening is I'm electronically sharing that information back to my designer or physically sharing it with them and saying, here's the color I've produced. Now I'm going to you for a sign off. Um, to approve this color. And then once that color is approved, it prepares us for what will be webinar number four in this series coming up later, um, where we talk about the production of the product. And in production, we even sometimes talk about using corrections and formulations. But that's how we're going to formulate the color. We're going to get to matching the color that the customer ultimately wanted. We're going to give them then the ability to produce that, and we'll have matched that top ring, which is what the epiphany color is, in our newly designed child's toy with a seasonal flare. So that's how we would go about formulating um, to the light in the life of this color. Thank you, Tim. So that wraps up today's short webinar, the third in our Life of a Color series. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to submit your questions now. We will leave this screen up for about 30 more seconds after this webinar. Um, again, we will follow up with you after the webinar on any of your questions, and you will also receive a recording to this webinar. Finally, after this webinar ends, we will have a polling question. If you are interested in speaking to a sales representative or even Tim, Feel free to answer that and we can get you in touch with the correct person. So thanks again, everyone, and please join us next time for the final webinar in the series on production and quality, quality control.